Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Good to see you. I'm a nervous wreck. Here's why. I'm okay to sit and do a reading for 30 minutes or something like that, but talking about myself for 30 minutes, it's going to end up somewhere between an AA testimonial <laughs> and being on a psychiatrist's uh, couch, I'm afraid. Uh, you know how these Southern writers, these are my buddies, and every one of them say, someone will say, how did you become a writer? And every one of them says, when I was 11 years old, I read the complete works of William Faulkner, and I knew right then <laughs> that I wanted to be a writer. Yeah, right, okay, good, that's great. That's not me. Um, my mentor was a guy named Henry Gibson. Do you remember Henry Gibson from that TV show Laugh-In? <laughs> oh, um, he had that big flower. So I thought, man, that guy's funny. And part of it may have been because everything I read in Greenwood, South Carolina was not funny. Wuthering Heights, Ethan Frome, that Charles Dickens guy. I thought, man, how boring. Do you have to just be suicidal to be a writer? So I saw this Henry Gibson guy on Laugh-In, and I thought, I want to be like that guy, even though I didn't really write anything down or uh, read whatsoever. I consider myself a writer, but I didn't ever write until I was maybe in college. And I'm here to tell you that what made me become a writer is because I'm stupid and I'm hard-headed. And those are the two basic requirements, I think, to be a writer. You've got to be stupid because you're going to get rejections all the time. If I said, ma'am, to you, hey, you want to go out on a date Friday night? And you said no. And then I waited next week, you want to go out Friday night? No. And I just got rejections for a year. I would probably quit asking you out on a date. But with writing, it's like, send something out. Rejection, all right, I got a rejection. And then you send it out again, and send it out again, and send it out again, all of that. Um, stupid. When, for some reason, I don't know why I started writing when I was in college, I was a philosophy major because that, I knew there would be a lot of jobs in that <laughs> field. Um, but I need to tell you this too, this story is gonna kinda zig back and forth, don't just think, that guy can't tell a story. He was all over the map when it, came, when it comes to dates. I know I'm gonna do this, so bear with me. So I was a philosophy major, and then I started reading stuff in college that was kind of funny. And I didn't know that it could be funny because I was from Greenwood, South Carolina, where nothing is funny. And I thought, I'm gonna try to do this. So I wrote and wrote and wrote, I mean, just nuts, wrote. And I wrote this first novel, it was 450 pages. And it kind of took, I had graduated, so it took the next year out of, out of college where I was working as a house painter because of that degree in philosophy. <laughs> um, so I wrote it and I knew this novel sucked real bad about page 200, but I went, I don't care because I'm dumb. I'm going to plow through this thing. Meanwhile, I had a professor that went, you know, and I, this is in third person. It took place in Nice, France. It took place in Nice, France, because I had been there for 10 days out of my life. I went there because I'd gone to Furman University. Back then it was Baptist. I wasn't. I wanted to get the hell out of there and go to France to, you know, study or do whatever. <laughs> Drink, probably. Um, so that 450 pages I knew stunk real bad at about 200, but I plowed through it. Meanwhile, I had a professor say, you know, this is in third person, and it's in Nice, France. You're from Greenwood, South Carolina. You're from a cotton mill town. In first person, you're kind of funny. Why are you writing it in third person, and why Nice? And I went, because I've got to have it in Nice, because exciting things happen over there. Nothing exciting happens in Greenwood. So I finished that thing. I didn't even know how to mail off a novel, so I just finished it. Took a minor character out of that novel, wrote the second novel. Again, in third person, this one took place in Washington, D.C., because I had spent eight months in Washington, D.C., a very exciting place compared to Greenwood, South Carolina. So I did that, and that one I knew it stunk real bad, about page 125. Then I had a professor say, you know, you're going to be ready at about 1,000 pages. I went, no, nah, I'm, I'm a lot smarter than that. I'm going to be able to write it way before. I'm going to get published before I'm 28, I thought. Second novel stunk real bad. I knew I took a minor character out of that one. Then I set this third novel, it's also in third person, in Memphis, Tennessee. And I'd never even been to Memphis. 
but I had a map, and I put the map on the wall, and I knew Beale Street meant something for Memphis, so <laughs> I had like this blues singer or whatever. That one stunk also, you know, it ended up 300 pages. Let's do some math. 450, 250, 300, 1,000, right? That's how that came to, came to 1,000 pages. I wasn't all that smart. By this time, I had something called an MFA in writing. Who knows about that? But um, I went off to teach college. I taught at this college where you taught. F now, I ain't saying that I'm not one of these people who goes, oh, man, this is so hard teaching college. Ooh, because I've done roofing and driven a garbage truck and stuff. I'll get back to that later. Um, so I started, I was teaching like four classes of 25 students in a class, and they had to write 10 papers each. That's another little math problem that I can't figure out. And I started writing short stories. Right about this time, I had this girlfriend. She was like from the Midwest. She ate a lot of granola, maybe took some yoga. And she said to me, in kind of this voice, I'm not making fun of her, but she said, you're scared to write in first person because you're scared to share your emotions, George. And then... <laughs> and I thought, jealousy, hatred, envy, those are emotions, aren't they? So I started writing in first person, kind of putting her as a character in every one of these things. I also... At this time, now I was like 27, 28, I don't know how I missed it, but I uh, started reading Flannery O'Connor, and that's when I said, oh, that's how you write about a small town where things are pretty daggum exciting, you got misfits running around and all that. I'm going to try that. So I started writing in first person, and I started writing uh, about the South, kind of. No, I, not kind of, I did. Uh, let me see where else this is going to go. First person, Flannery O'Connor, mean woman. Okay, so I started writing, I started writing short stories because I, I couldn't write another big fat novel. I didn't even know how to mail out or anything. And things started clicking. I mean, I started just kind of hitting. So maybe I published, you know, in uh, the late 80s, probably a dozen, 15 stories. And one was in a literary magazine. And, uh, well, I mean, they, all of them were in literary magazines. This agent named Nat Sobel, he's one of these guys, I think he's still alive, he's 140, but he's one of those guys that reads literary magazines, that he read mine and he contacted me and he said, do you need an agent? Do you have a book of short stories? And I went, yeah, I do, I do. So I got together, I didn't, but I got together something and I mailed it to him and he actually tried to sell this collection of stories and it didn't sell or anything. And he wrote me, finally, this back before internet and stuff, he wrote me and said, you need to write a novel. I said, I've written three. They're really bad. They suck real bad. He said, write another one. So I did. But this is before internet. So back then, I <laughs> wrote a novel, photocopied it, put it in a big magazine, put an essay, I mean, in a big envelope, S-A-S-E, mailed it off. I'm going to tell you this, too, and I'm not poor mouthing, but I used to collect aluminum cans. I kind of lived near these two bars, and they were always beer cans, so I just took them. Then I'd take them to the recycling center, and I'd use that money to buy stamps. I still do that to this day. <laughs> Kalinda, my better half, is like, just take them to the recycle. Just take them to where we take the garbage. No, I might get $1.29 on these cans. <laughs> okay, so I wrote this novel. It, too, kind of sucked, but at least it was in first person. And I put it in the mail to Nat Sobel. And my arm was still in that mailbox when he sent the rejection. I mean, I was just <laughs> like that. And I went, damn, that was fast. What kind of US Postal Service is working? This is in Florence, South Carolina. And he just left a note that he had a note that said, I don't like this, write another. Oh, here's where hard-headed comes into it. That was in 1988, maybe. Um, I don't like people telling me what to do. Uh, you know, if I'm an electrician and someone keeps saying, you ought to be a plumber, you ought to be a plumber, you ought to be a plumber, I want to be an electrician. Shut up, you know? So he said, write another, and I decided then, and this is how stupid I am, that I was just going to write short stories forever, because that's what I like to write anyway, right? So I wrote short stories from 1988 or 89 until about 2003. Short story, short story, short story. Mostly in first person, some not. 
um, all in the South. And occasionally I would like maybe send off somewhere and I'd get a rejection on a collection, but whatever. Then in about 1999, I just, a lot of good things happened. I had a story come out in Harper's Magazine, I had one in Atlantic Monthly, had one in Playboy that had the word damn in it, not a dirty story whatsoever. Um, I think it said, damn, where are all these naked people? No, it didn't do that. <laughs> um, then agents started contacting me again. And they were like, hey, George, just read this story. Here's in Atlantic Monthly. Do you have a novel? And I was just hanging up. Now, also, I was drinking pretty hard back then. So I was just hanging up on them, you know. No, I never thought about it. Because they kind of treated me like old Southern rude boy, you know, like, have you ever thought of writing a novel? No, I never thought about that. <laughs> I've been thinking about writing haiku poetry next. Or maybe a cookbook that involves Vienna sausages. So. Um, Alabama's going to come into this story, by the way. No, 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 that was a weird segue. Um, I just reminded myself. So, I had, now I'm a bunch of stories. I've been in news stories from the South. I've been in all these good magazines and stuff. And I happened to be in Alabama teaching kind of a visiting writer at this place called Mount, Mount Meggs. Y'all know Mount Meggs? It's like a juvenile, it's a sad, sad place. So I was there, and I met this man named Wayne Greenhaw, and he had something to do with what was then called Black Belt Press. And he said to me, what are you doing, waiting around for New York? And I went, kinda, I just don't care, I'm just writing, that's all I'm doing. And he said, we'd like to put out a book of your stories. And I said, okay, what the hell? So I sent him, you know, 12 or 15 stories, and they published, and there's this book called These People Are Us. And then all hell kind of broke loose. I need to tell you all this before I get to my book that I'm pushing now, so I swear it's gonna make sense. <laughs> um, so, that came out and it got uh, reprinted by Harcourt and then, you know, things went from there. I need to also go back and mention the stuff about Flannery O'Connor that I forgot to mention and about first person. You know, Flan when I started reading Flannery O'Connor, she had said something like, anyone who makes it through childhood has enough to write about for the rest of his or her life. <laughs> And then I thought back then, I don't know, did I, did I have a weird childhood or not? And, and I started thinking about it. And um, My father, I was born in Anaheim, California. Don't hold that against me. My father's in the Merchant Marines. He had run away from home at age 16 to join the Merchant Marines. He had a 10th grade education. Uh, I was born out there. When I was five, he fell 45 feet into the um, hold of a ship. He broke his hips, his back. 57 bones all together. Um, he was a morphine addict for a long, ooh, had to cry. Morphine addict for a long time. Then he uh, drank pretty hard. You know, and the doctors kind of went from, you ain't gonna get out of a bed, you ain't gonna get off of a wheel, out of a wheelchair, crutches and all that. Y'all know how hip surgery's been, especially over the last 20 years or something, but he was kind of, I have, oh, this is kind of gross y'all out. It's before lunch though. I have some of my father's old artificial hips on my desk because when one would wear out, they'd you know, take it out, put in a new one and go, here little boy. So um, my wife had to get artificial hip and I took one of my dad's, you know, it looks like this big railroad spike and I went to the orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Ridgeway, and went, could you use this? Would that save us some money? <laughs> he, he would have thought I had a bar of gold. That guy's like, is that the Zimaloy 3000? So, it's back on my desk. Anyway, so my dad fell, and because he fell, he was disabled. So, my grandfather lived in Greenwood, South Carolina, and had a very small textile supply company. So, my grandfather, my dad's father, said, why don't you move to South Carolina? You can kind of work for me. I'll pay you under the table. And my dad said, okay. So, we, you know, got in a car, and we drove across the country. We stopped in um, Dallas, Texas on the way because my dad's biological mom, Nelta, lived there. It's the only time I met her. She played honky-tonk piano in a burlesque show owned by, or burlesque venue, owned by Jack Ruby, the guy who killed Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald. When I met her, um, my dad was on crutches at this point, it was like August, she said, I was seven. Little George, the Easter Bunny brought something for you here. I'm like, okay, Easter's like in April. This is August. 
it was one of those like cardboard and cellophane um, rabbits, chocolate rabbits. It turned white because, you know, <laughs> and its head had been gnawed off. <laughs> so just this body. And she handed it to me. And I was just a little kid with toe, you know, toe head kid. And I, I was just staring at it because it kind of scarred me, you know. <laughs> And my dad hit me with that uh, crutch on the back of the hamstring. A, a lot of this went throughout my life. And said, what do you say? Thank you, Grandma. Thank you for this headless uh, <laughs> Easter bunny. Anyway, so we moved on to South Carolina. And then we started going to the church with my, my grandfather and my dad's stepmother. Her name was Esther. So I had one named Nelta and Esther. Those are good names. They went to this church. It was a Baptist church. And so we went Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday. I remember the first time I went, and we, so we didn't go in California. It's not like my parents were brought up in churches, but we just didn't go. Um, I remember in a Sunday school class with cray, you know, crayons and coloring Jesus, and I started crying real bad because everybody seemed to know who this Jesus guy was except for me. And, that, you know, <laughs> stupid again. But um, so anyway, we went Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, 1965. Someone, the preacher said, hey, congregation, you got any questions? And this man stood up and said, what do we do if a black person comes in this church? And he didn't use the word black. And somebody else stood up and said, ignore him and hope he don't come back. And everybody went, ha, 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 ha. And my dad got up on those crutches and led, I thought I'd done something really wrong, you know, maybe it's because I was crying about Jesus, and walked us out, and we were kind of near the front, you know, one of the front pews, and we walked out slowly. And after that, my father just wouldn't even allow me to go to church. I, I had the opposite kind of upbringing. You know, if I'd say, hey, Vivian, my girlfriend, wants me to attend church with her, and he'd go, no, nah, you're not going to do that. Don't go. When I went to Furman later, a Baptist school, he went, oh, that's great. I'm glad you're, you're going there. Have fun paying for it, because I'm not going to give that Baptist college any money. Um, <laughs> I wash a lot of dishes uh, there. Okay, so anyway, so that kind of seemed to have a seminal uh, mark on my, or whatever, on my, uh, an important part in my writing career, right? So I did that. Somewhere along, I mean, I got thrown out of church. Uh, somewhere along this line, I started running. And by running, I mean like Forrest Gump running. You know, like when Forrest decides, I'm gonna run across the country, Gen A and all that stuff. That's kind of what I was doing. That's the whole reason I went to Furman, because I was an okay runner, even now I was like smoking drink like crazy. But anyway, um, the Furman track coach, cross country coach, said come on, and I did. And Then I got kind of injured uh, my senior year. I ripped an oblique. The doctor in Greenwood, who was stupid and hard headed, said, you got gas for like six months, you know? And I went, I don't, I don't think that's the truth. But so anyway, um, that's kind of uh, how I was brought up. And that's how I was able to kind of dip into the well and look at, let me see if I got any of these other little stories in here written down. Uh, father, oh yeah, 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 I do. <laughs> my grandfather fired my father. After the church incident, and my dad kind of arguing with his own dad, grandpa said, no more, you ain't working here anymore. So my dad, we, he made $180 a month on disability. And I was an only child, but still 180 bucks in 1965, not great. So my father opened up a business to compete against his own father. We had to put it in my mom's name. Here's what we made, this is like show and tell. These are called replacement aprons, even though it doesn't look like an apron. It's a belt. It's got a little beveled thing on it. They glue together like that. Put it on a spinning frame or, or loom. Uh, yarn runs on it so it doesn't uh, snag. When you get the spinning frame or loom, it has rubber gaskets that eventually crack, and they just use these things on it. So my dad started up a business. My dad was really paranoid that Social Security was going to be after him. So a lot of times after school, I would just go stand in this place that had a lot of machinery. It was a one-man operation. It had a lot of machinery that would cut off your fingers, like a splitting machine. It has a 13-foot band blade on it that goes and you put, the, put this leather, which is a little bit thicker, cowhide or calfskin. You put these strips through and it makes it, this is 50 thousandths thick, right? I had to do this because my dad said, what if Social Security comes? If they do, I'm going to say my son's working the splitting machine. I went, oh, okay, dad. So, 
because my dad started this competitive business, Grandpa thought a good idea to kidnap little George. So, <laughs> in the, um, so I, by this time I was in the seventh grade. So I'm just like hanging out in junior high school and the, I got called to the principal's office and they said, your grandfather's coming here to pick you up. And I said, let me call up my mom. And I did, and she said, no, 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 no. Why in the world, I'm picking you up, you know? So I never really figured out what that was, or it was hidden from me what that was all about. But that was another thing that maybe uh, added to my I made it through childhood portion. How am I doing on time? Is it like four o'clock yet? <laughs> uh, I got hit by a car when I was 14 years old. The car was going 55 miles an hour, they say. It hit me from behind. I landed at a telephone pole. I was knocked out for three, I was like unconscious for three days, in the hospital for 10. I didn't break a bone. I have a lot of scars like on my elbows and knees and ankle and hip. Not bad. Um, uh, it was a hit and run. The lunch ladies from my school were behind the woman who hit me on Powerhouse Road, it was called, Highway 254 in Greenwood, and they got her license plate number. So when my writing, sometimes lunch ladies are kind of heroes, you know, or, or whatever. Let's see what else I got here. Hmm. My <laughs> This probably has something to do with my writing. Uh, my dad thought it necessary growing up for me to meet people from all walks of life. He didn't trust uh, rich people very much because in the town there were like three families of mill owners who, you know, I, I don't want to say my dad was y a union kind of guy, but he just felt like they weren't getting very good health care and they weren't getting paid very much. The only two books I've kind of read in high school, my father told me to read this again, he had 10th grade education. It was The Communist Manifesto and Socialism by Emil Durkheim. I'm not sure where he came, there wasn't a bookstore in my hometown. I'm not sure where he got this. I'm not some kind of commie or anything, but okay, dad, I'll read that stuff. And, and um, uh, did that, but anyway, he would always want me to pe meet people from all walks of life. And I can think of one in particular. When I woke up, I was about eight, and he said, you need a rabbit for a pet. And I went, I, I don't like rabbits. I don't, why would I want a rabbit? I want a dog. Uh, I, I know a man selling rabbits. We can get you a rabbit for a pet. So he took me out to this place out in the country. And there the guy had rabbits. The guy also didn't have a right arm. So he, he's just a left-handed guy with rabbits. And my dad <laughs> bought this white rabbit. We named it Snowball because we really had a lot of um, creativity in our household. <laughs> And then my father said, shake hands with him, son. So I took my right hand out to shake hands, and I got one of those kind of like handshakes because the guy didn't have a right arm. And then on the way back, I think at this point my dad was probably walking with a cane, and he hit me on the hamstring and said, you have to pay attention, son. You just got to pay attention. So those are the kind of childhood things that now I went, okay, maybe I do have things to write about. Let's see if I got any more. Uh, Nah, you know, in college, in the summers, I drove a garbage truck, maybe the best job I've ever had in my life. I wish to goodness I knew then what I know now, because I'm pretty sure people were throwing away like Tiffany lampshades on the side of the road. <laughs> Just take it to the dump. Um, I drove a water truck, painted houses. My father once said, if you learn how to paint a house, you'll never be out of a job, and that was right. Um, even when I was teaching college in the summers, I painted houses. I started up a company called Tom Sawyer Paint Company. Get other people to paint their houses, you know? <laughs> um, okay, so now we're back to Alabama and that first book. Sorry, I kind of forgot about that part. I told you it was gonna zigzag a little bit. Uh, so, you know, that book kind of did okay, and then somehow I got on NPR, that morning edition, and kind of all hell broke loose. And then, out of nowhere, Shannon Ravenel, who's been here before, right? Uh, was editor at Algonquin, and she said, we want your next book. And I said, okie dokie, even though you kind of rejected that last one, but okay, you know, all right. So I sent her a bunch of stories, all been published, these are the ones that have been in Atlantic and all that, Harper's. Um, she said, George, I want you to place the, you gotta connect them a little bit better. They're just kind of stories scattershot. And I went, well, okay, I've seen books like that before, but all right. 
she wanted me to do more of a um, Winesburg, Ohio kind of thing, you know, Sherwood Anderson. So I made up a town called 45. Originally, I was thinking about this little town near where I was brought up called 96, but I didn't want to call it 96. I want to call it 69, but <laughs> Shannon, <laughs> Shannon said, no, we're not going to have you write a bunch of stories about this town called 69. So, um, so I, I made it 45, like a gun, like Colt 45, like a 45 a platter, you know, a, a, a vinyl disc. So I did that. She also gave me the best advice in the world when she said, a great short story's ending kisses the beginning. So if you start off in a used car lot, you kind of end with a used car lot. You know, you make it a circle. She said, a great, and this is how, y'all saw her probably, so she kind of talks like this, you know. George, a great short story's ending kisses its beginning. And too many of your short stories are groping the beginning. I went, <laughs> Thanks for being my cheerleader. So that book was called Half Mammals of Dixie, and it came out like in hardback, and then Harcourt, again, did the next one. Then I had a book called Why Dogs Chase Cars, also took place in this town called 45, and actually had a character, this goes all the way back to those bad novels I wrote where I kept you know, taking out characters and putting them in the next one. Why Dogs Chase Cars is all narrated by a guy who shows up in one story in Half Mammals of Dixie. Then things are going okay, and I was getting a lot of grief from an agent. Now, okay, okay, now I have an agent, by the way, named Liz Derensoff, great woman. Um, she kind of was an agent for Clyde Edgerton, a whole Southern, Larry Brown, uh, Jill McCorkle, Lee Smith, and a bunch of kind of Southern writers. Um, but she was like, you need to write a novel. And then uh, Shannon, you need to write, everybody's saying you gotta write a novel. And I'm thinking, damn it, I've already gone through this one time before. And that didn't really work out all that well. And again, maybe I was drinking a little bit too hard, but I was writing a short story that I wanted to call novel. Ha, 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 I was going to make a little joke. <laughs> and it got to be about page 40, and I think that's a little bit too long. And this man, I got an email from him today at the hotel named Andre Bernard, was the president of Harcourt, and he called up. He's like one of these Harvard guys. I mean, he's the opposite of me. And he, and he talks exactly like he said, George, what are you working on now? And I said, and that, you know... And my mom was real sick. My dad long died. He died when I was 24. Um, so my mom has been sick. It was, she made some questionable financial decisions in her life, like spending it all as soon as dad died. Um, <laughs> um, I said to Andre, I'm writing a novel. The main character's name is Novel. And he's writing a long poem. And I went on and on and on. And he offered me a lot of money, like an advance money. This is back in the day when that could happen. So then I had to write it. So, and it's, ter I mean, it's, I see it's for sale up here. Not my favorite thing. I'm a better short story writer. So I wrote that. And then I, and I made up a new town called Gruel. It takes place in Gruel. Then there's a book of short stories with some of those same characters that are in that novel called Drowning in Gruel. Then I wrote another one that's kind of normal called Work Shirts for Mad Men, another big fat novel. But I... I was tired of it. I said, I'm a better short story writer. Liz, the agent, said, I'm not going to try to sell another one of your books of stories until you write a novel that I like. I said, well, that ain't going to happen. You know, you know, whatever. And she said, it's been nice doing business or something like that. You know, whatever. We're on good terms now. So uh, I just started writing. I just wanted to write short stories. I got a new agent. Her name was Kit Ward. She did a two-book deal for a book called Stray Decorum and one called Between Wrecks. And then she passed away unexpectedly. <coughs> In great. No, I'm just kidding about that part. <laughs> um, so then I wrote, and then after that, I wrote one called Callous Town. I made up a town called Callous Town, and that's it. Somewhere in between, there's this kind of goofy book called Pep Talks, Warnings, and Screeds, because someone just offhandedly said, you ought to write stories about, you know, writing exercises and writing... Uh, you know, advice and stuff. And I, okay, I'll do it. So I wrote this book called Pep Talks, Warnings, and Screeds that my buddy Daniel Wallace, who's been here, who wrote Big Fish, he did the illustrations for this book. It's a well-illustrated book. The advice kind of sucks. Anyway, <laughs> now we get to staff picks, which is what I'm supposed to be promoting. Oh, sorry, I spit a little bit. Um, <laughs> Because I'm always just kind of think, because I ain't got nothing else to do in South Carolina. I'm just trying to think up little, little exercises for myself. I'll write a whole bunch of stories about a town called Callistown. 
I'll write, you know, stories that everyone's got a dog in it, whatever. I came up, I was gonna try to write a bunch of stories that, that were all holiday stories. And the reason why I did this, because I thought, because I gotta do a lot of readings and stuff, I could say, y'all know it's Arbor Day, and I just happen to have an Arbor Day story right here. <laughs> so, you know, I got through the Columbus Day, the Father's Day, the Mother's Day, the Valentine's Day, Arbor Day. There are a lot of holidays, you know? So then, somewhere along the line, I thought, I had this student, she taught me this term. She never, she looked really blank in the face. She kind of looked mean all the time. And I would say to her, she's in med school now, and are you mad at me or something? What? And she says, I have something called RBF. Do y'all know this term? Yes. Okay, good. Because I didn't. Y'all are nasty. Um, <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to kind of write a story about her, and I wrote one called Staff, I, I called this person Staffordshire, because Staffordshire's a china, it's a plate. Plate kind of has RBF. And then I thought, I'm going to do these holiday stories. I'm going to write some other ones. Forget about the holiday stuff. And I'm going to call this book Staff Picks. Because then people be walking into a bookstore and go, well, that must be good. The staff picked it, you know. <laughs> um, that didn't work out all that well. But um, that's, the, that's the story of how I got to those particular stories. And actually, a bunch of those stories are in third person, and more of them have uh, women protagonists. Um, but not first person women, because I, I would not, because I'm not good at it. I, I, one time I wrote a short, so one time I got a letter from an editor at Red Book Magazine, and she said, don't forget about us. This is back when I was doing that Harper's, and I went on that big role. So I wrote this story from a uh, woman's point of view. She was on her honeymoon. Um, I didn't know, you know, I, I don't know. So I put things like, that night at the hotel room, I went in the bathroom to, and I wrote, A, put on my teddy, B, get buck naked, C, put on pajamas. There was a whole lot of that, and um, it got rejected, <laughs> and, and the, editor, the editor wrote, don't ever do this again. Uh, stupid, hard-headed. All right, man, that's, not a lot, that's only like, how long I've been up here? Okay, well, hold on. Let me just see if I got anything else here. I was 42 years old when my first book came out, so I didn't make that 30-year thing because I was stupid. Uh, mm, father. Mother was from Michigan. I don't know what that has to do with anything. Uh, grandma, and the, grandma and the weird rabbit. One-armed man. That's about it. Hey, <laughs> there's actually a hell of a lot in between, but I can't talk about half of it. There might be some jail. I don't want to talk about that. Hey, who's got a question? Let's do that. <laughs> I'm better at that. I'm way better at that, I promise. Please. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So uh, you're a Southern writer. What does that mean? That's a great question. Here's what I think. Uh, normally, I'm going to ask that question if I'm somewhere else in the country, like Iowa City. Um, are you a Southern writer? I think they want to know, are you going to drink and act fool sometime <laughs> when you're in our city limits? I think that's what they, I, th I do think that. Because I'm going to, no, I'm an Inuit writer. I mean, what the hell, you know? Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I would either, th you're either because you're from the South or because your s stories are set in the South. And all of my stories are set, well, most of them in South Carolina, I guess. Except maybe the first, couple, first book I know, I had an Alabama story in there. Um, um, I, I, and I'm not quite sure what the... There's a whole bunch of um, um, curiosity about Southern writers, because you don't ever talk about Northern, Northeastern writers or <laughs> Midwestern writers. I mean, this thing called Fellowship of Southern Writers, is a lot, it's been around for a while, and there's like 30 of us or whatever, but I never hear of Fellowship of, um, what was that? That wasn't a gun or anything. I never hear <laughs> somebody from the Midwest. Yeah, we got Midwestern writers. Um, I, don't ever, I don't ever hear about it. 
And, you know, I think it's just about people doing the best they can with what they got, you know. It's, uh, but that's some other, I mean, other writers from other parts of the country do that. But in the South, when I think of the writers that I really cotton to, Flannery O'Connor, Barry Hanna, Larry Brown, a bunch, it's just kind of everyday people just trying to get by, you know. I don't ever write about, like, Civil War. I don't write about stuff that a lot of, you know, deer hunting, Civil War, um, I mean, it might be just a little part. If I do write about the Civil War, I'm going to put Hampton Sides in there. <laughs> it's good to see Hampton. Hampton I met in New York City, of all places, in 2001 at like a photo shoot thing. We were both wearing makeup. We were manly. <laughs> Thanks, but I, I'm sorry I couldn't. I, just, I, don't, I don't know the answer. I'm, I, and I think about it sometimes. Not too much, because otherwise I just go, ooh. I gotta put I gotta put pimento cheese in this story, <laughs> and I love pimento cheese. Yes, ma'am. Who, like who do I like to read currently, or who am I reading currently? <laughs> who who I like, who I love is this guy named Lewis Norden. Lewis Norden is from Itabena, Mississippi. He's passed away now. He wrote Wolf Whistle. This is gonna sound bad what I'm gonna say, but I promise, it's kind of based on Emmett Till's lynching, but it's a real funny novel. But I mean, it's really sad and serious. I'm spitting again, sorry. I need, a, one of those, I need to go buy like one of those like Quincy's and get y'all a spit guard. Um, he wrote Wolf Whistle, Music of the South, Lightning Song, uh, All Girl Football Team, Sugar Among the Freaks, uh, something about Arrow Catcher Fair. Kind of, kind of made it his own little Yoknapatawpha County in Arrowcatcher, Mississippi. It's kind of what I think that I've tried to do with 45 and Gruel and Callistown. It's all kind of in that same area. That's probably my favorite writer, uh, I, I think. And I teach, teach him a lot. Uh, my students love him because he's funny. I mean, I, after I learned that crap from Greenwood where nothing can be funny and got to college and went, oh yeah, things can be. Because I have students who go, man, we've only read, well, nothing, but uh, you know, Stuff that's <laughs> sad. Um, contemporary writers, um, Brad Watson, who's from, uh, I think, Meridian, Mississippi, originally, is, I think, a really great writer. Tom Franklin. I got a new book coming out in September that's uh, selected, like 30 stories, and Tom Franklin's doing the introduction to it, or the, excuse me, the foreword. Um, so I got to say I like him because he's doing that. Otherwise, I hate the guy. <laughs> I can't stand him. He's probably, he's been here, I'm sure, right? Y'all had everybody except me, didn't you? <laughs> what are y'all doing, running? Just like, damn, we got to ask Singleton now. We've run out of people. <laughs> and a bunch, you know, Mary Gateskill. Um, there's, there's just tons, tons and tons of writers. And I kind of change every, um, every year, I'd say. I'm going to tell you this. I know everybody loves that Faulkner guy. And I've read, when I turned about 33, I went, oh, I'm going to trudge through this stuff. And I went... You know, like that's Sound and the Fury. I only part I understood was that Benji, that like guy who's, you know, wasn't quite there. I understood that part. <laughs> Rest, I went, come on. And I admire uh, those books, Absalom, Absalom. I admire Light in August. I kind of follow Sanctuary, kind of a detective. I, I followed that one because it wasn't all that highfalutin. Who else? Come on, please. We only have 45 more hours. <laughs> Let's do like two more questions and then we'll go to lunch. I'll let y'all, it'll be early. Good. Yes, ma'am. I would like to know how you write. Do you write manually? Do you write on a computer? Do you write on a computer? Do you write on a computer? Do you write on a For a long time, I kind of changed this. I wrote an essay about this for like Tin House. I hand wrote for a long time. I hand wrote because there's another one of these, that's one of my childhood. That's right, right after I got out of college, house painting got broken into. Somebody stole my typewriter. Good luck with that. Who steals a typewriter? What are you going to go, ooh, I'm going to go write. Um, so I hand wrote all the time because no one's going to steal a notebook. Um, and I still kind of go back and forth, you know, and I'm also real superstitious. So if I write, if I, if I hand write a story and then type it out on a computer and send it and it gets accepted by some big old magazine, I go, that's what I got to do for the next one. And then if I go like four or five in a row, they go, that didn't suck, 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 didn't work. I'll just go back to the computer and do that. Seems like I'm doing kind of half and half. Like I'll start handwriting, and by the t then I go, and then kind of go on from there. It just kind of follows. But no real, 
rhyme or reason on, on either of that. Um, it's better for me to handwrite because it makes you go through an editing. You know, when I, norm, when I write, let's say I'm writing a short story, I'll go, let's say it's a perfect day and just everything's, let's say I have a perfect two weeks. About a thousand words. Next day, read through that. Notice how my main character has changed names mysteriously. <laughs> Fix that. And then do, you know, try to get a thousand words on that. Next day, read the 2,000 words. Uh-oh, you know, they've changed towns now. Get through, and you go through that. I'm not one of those people that goes, and now I shall set it in a drawer for six months and come, because it all, I will just say, it's, that's terrible. Yeah, if I, I get out and just let the editors, you know, if they say, and half time, you know, one editor said, man, love the beginning, hated the ending. Send it to another place. Hated the beginning, love the ending. Well, what the heck? Come on, somebody give me an answer. Um, so, so it's no real, no real thing. It's just basically trying to write. And I'm not like the write every day kind of guy. But, that's, but if I don't write for like five days, I get real depressed. I'm not real depressed. It's not like I'm <laughs> championing nooses or anything. But <laughs> pretty, pretty depressed. Okay, we got one. We got time for one more. One more. I saw a hand go up over there. I promise. I no. Thank you. I'm trying to think because it was a long time ago. So this is back probably in the '90s when I wrote this, and I remember. Oh, I know it took place in Opelika because I love the town of Opelika just to say it, and I think it was about. Um, and this would be in that first book called "These People Are Us." And it would have been a story about, I think, I think, I, I, I remember, I can see myself when I was writing this thing, there was a, um, a place in a parking lot selling Leland cypresses or something, or selling some kind of plants. And I think it took place in that, but I don't, I don't remember at all. And I've been to Alabama a bunch, and I've been to, Bur one time I came to Birmingham to, to, um, to read at five colleges, you know, UAB, Montevallo, Samford, Birmingham Southern, and Miles. And I've been to like um, that mean guy, what's his name? Jake Reese, who's at <laughs> Alabama Booksmith. I've been to his place a bunch. Um, that was easy, if I'd have known that, I would have mentioned him a lot earlier. Um, Recently, I was up near Sand Mountain to do a couple things at North Alabama Community College. I felt pretty uh, comfortable around there because it was like snake handling kind of stuff. <laughs> I actually like snakes a lot, but, but not copperheads. Where do you teach? Wofford College. It's in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's small. It's Methodist. It's the, my, one of my best friends, the chaplain. It's funny, all that stuff I told you all, a bunch of my friends are, are ministers, or a bunch of them are ex-ministers now, but that's another story. <laughs> um, and they're all smart. They all went to, like, Duke. I mean, all those, you know, um, um, not that, well, yeah, they're smart. Um, Wofford is, you know, small Methodist liberal arts college. That's them probably last year for its basketball team because I taught all those people, and that's how they know basketball really well. <laughs> Great guys, and, and, and now I have a bunch of women basketball players who could just beat my butt if they wish to, and they're great basketball, and great scholars too, so I like them. That about it, that it. <laughs> <laughs>